excited about that. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to pray and we're going to get right in to God's Word. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your precious saints of God who are here. And we remember those who are not here. We think of Phyllis Tunicliffe this morning who has had an attack on her gallbladder, her, her pancreas, and her liver ex experiencing bad infection. And so God, her heart is here with us and our heart is with her and we pray for her now. And in Jesus' name, we ask that you heal her, God, and give her a touch in her body. And we think of Earl Littlefield, who you did raise up this week, and we praise you for that, God. We prayed, we got right to pray, and as soon as we found out and we saw that fluid just subside from his body, and Lord, you worked in a miraculous way for him, so we thank you. But he's home recovering, and we just pray for him this morning. We pray for full recovery in Jesus' name. And God, we ask today that you would be with us. Open our eyes to your word. Remind us again of how faithful you are and how we can trust you. And I believe the special blessing that you have for your people this morning is on the way. And you pray in faith with me, believing in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. I want to go ahead and read the portion of Scripture we're in today. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body, more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will He not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. The word of God for the people of God. Today, we've got further proof before us. Proof of the immense practicality of Jesus and living life in His kingdom. I don't think there could be anything more common to humanity than feelings of worry and anxiety about the future, right? <laughs> Amen. we got one honest person in here this morning. It seems that it's built into our society, the framework of who we are, that we worry. We worry about the economy. We worry over political issues. We worry about national security. And if I were a conspiracy theorist, which I'm not, just for the record, but if I were, you would think that maybe the media knows that the more angst they create in American society, the more we're going to tune in. If you scare us, we'll watch because we have this weird need to know what's coming next that's scary and terrifying. So you keep watching, they'll keep reporting, and they'll keep laughing all the way to the bank. All right? It seems that in our society we have all these questions. And by the way, it's no coincidence that the passage that comes right before 
Jesus talking about worry and anxiety is all about, you know it, right? Money. And by the way, didn't Pastor Ray do a great job last week? We appreciate him. He inspired me to wear this bow tie this morning, in fact. I got to see his recording. It's all he wore bow tie. But anyway, appreciate him preaching to us and, and reminding us where our treasure really is. Jesus ends that passage by saying, you cannot serve God and wealth. You have to serve one or the other. One's going to be your master. You know as well as I do, there are people who are serving their wealth. They are driven. They are led around by the economy and what the stock market is doing. Boy, I'd hate to have a master that was so inconsistent and unstable as money. As stocks and bonds and all those other things I have a hard time understanding. Here's the deal, folks. We have a master who doesn't waver and doesn't change, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's consistent. He's not like the stock market. I'd rather be led around by Him. And, and, and the funny thing is, there, there's people who aren't even wealthy that are still being led around, worrying, wondering what's going to happen with their money. And so this brings us to our passage today. Jesus is telling us, you don't worry about any of these material things. Now notice in this passage, He repeats it three times. Do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. Three prohibitions, not suggestions, commands telling us that God's people don't worry. But you know those two little words, don't you? That creep in. Two little words that come in and like to steal our peace and steal our joy. And take our peace of mind from us. Two little words. What if? I don't know what your sabotage patterns look like that steal your joy away from you, but I have them. Mine typically goes something like this. I'm outside on the back deck. It's a beautiful day. My adorable little girls are playing in the yard. My adorable wife is inside mixing up a salad. I'm doing what men do. I'm throwing meat on fire, you know, to cook it up. Just sirloin. We can't afford ribeye. But anyway. Um, <laughs> in what should be a wonderful day, a, a, a day of joy, tranquility, you know, all of a sudden, a crazy, irrational, out of nowhere thought creeps into my mind. What if? What if I lose all this? What if I lose my wife? Could I handle it? Could I be up to the task? What if, God forbid, I lost a child? Could I survive? And, and, and these irrational what if thoughts of worry begin to come into my brain. And, and of course, I could think back down the generations and I could show you how my dad does those very same things and would never let me and my three brothers ride in the same car together for like the first 20 years of our life. Because he could handle losing one, I guess, but not all. I don't know. I mean... It's kind of morbid if you think about it. You know, one of you goes, okay, but I can't handle all three of you. Well, I mean, whatever. And I can show you how his mother before him thought the same exact thoughts. But, but you know, here's, here's what I think today. You may feel that way too, but I think that's more than just our genetics. I think that's more than just a personality thing. I believe it's spiritual attacks on our joy. I believe it's spiritual attacks on our peace. If Jesus thought enough about worry to say, do not worry, I think the enemy loves to come in and get us to break that little simple command. 
It seems so insignificant. And he gets us to break that command of Jesus. And before you know it, he has got control. And our brains and our minds are in such a dark place that we feel like we're in a pit we can't get out of. What we're going to be talking about today is what the old Assemblies of God preacher Dave Wilkerson said. we got to take our what ifs and turn them into God is. That's pretty good. That's, that's Brother Wilkerson, not me. Okay. But that's what we're going to be learning from Jesus today. How to turn your what if into a God is. So Jesus begins with some specifics. Things that you are specifically not to worry about. Between worry about food, clothing, and our bodies, which would naturally include shelter, He pretty well covers all the basic human needs. Now, He is saying about these basic human needs, do not worry about them. Now, keep in mind, He's specifically talking about needs, not all these wants and excessive things that are spoiling our kids rotten, okay? Talking about the basics here. Food, shelter, clothing. But before we go any further with his words, we need to be honest and real about where we are here this morning. Look around this room, and almost everyone without exception has their pantries and refrigerators full of food. Almost every single person in here has a roof over their head. Most of you have air conditioning. I'm sorry about yesterday if you did, but the fact of the matter is most of us have our needs met and even our wants. You were able to get here today in this modern invention called an automobile. You didn't rely on somebody to get you here. Most of you today are so much more blessed than 99% of the world. You understand this? And as I've said before, I'll remind you again, when Scripture addresses the rich, when Jesus talks about the rich, if you're living in the United States of America, 99% of the time, you're the ones He's talking to. In fact, the middle class has more than even the wealthy of Jesus' day, more conveniences before them. Now you have to keep in mind that the Savior who is uttering these words that we look at and study this morning was an itinerant traveling rabbi who had left his home and his profession, who had gone to the shores of Galilee and called those fishermen to leave their homes and to leave their profession. And they were literally traveling around in an itinerant ministry Relying on the kindness of other people to provide them a place to lay their head at night and to provide them food. That's our Jesus that we're talking about. These people knew what it was like to rely on God and not to worry about daily provisions. So here's what I want to say to you this morning. If Jesus looked at His crowd of followers, himself in their same position, who had to worry about their daily provision of food, and then he explicitly forbid them from worry about it, how much more should we, who live in the richest nation in the history of the world, follow the Lord's command, not to worry. As Jesus continues on, he employs a common Jewish rhetorical device here called call my owner. It means how much more. So the thought of Jesus was if the birds of the air are protected and cared for by our Father, how much more should you be protected? and cared for by your heavenly Father. That's why He uses the birds as an example. You know, God loves all of His creatures. I had to kill a rat recently, and it honestly broke my heart. Seriously. I mean, I had to club this little guy over the head with a baseball. Bat. And he was looking at me, and he knew what I was doing. His little black beady eyes. And I just... 
I had to look away. God loves all his creatures. He does. He loves the birds. He loves even the rats. You can't believe it, but he does. And, and the logic here that Jesus uses is if he loves them, those little creatures that much, there was only one of his creatures that he looked at them and he breathed his breath of life into them. And he looked at them and created them in his image. And that's you. And if God loves and cares for these little creatures, how much more of space in his heart do you occupy? He's trying to get you to see your priority in the mind of God. You're his. You belong to him. He loves you infinitely more than he loves the little birds. And yet he cares for them. What Jesus is giving us is something called natural theology. Natural theology, is, it sounds complicated, but it's really quite simple. It just means you go out into God's world and you see what God is doing. And you observe Him and you see Him in all of the patterns and all the beauty and all of the processes and the fauna and the flora of life. You see Him. You see His handiwork. And you're able to conclude things about Him through His handiwork. Jesus is saying to us, look around you at this creation. Do you not see the providing and sustaining hand of God at work? And the thing is, folks, we're not deists. Have you heard that term before? Deism? That's a term that means, it's a belief that there was a God way back through the eons of history who created the world and the universe that we see around us. And then, like a watchmaker, he, he wound it up. And then he stepped away and he let it all play out. So, so he created and then he, he just lets it all play out. And he's very much outside and separate from it. Do you know that's not what we believe as Christians? As Christians, we're theists, not Deists. See, a Christian theist is someone who believes in a God who is both creator and sustainer. They believe in a God who created this world and did not leave it when he created it. He continued to fill it with his presence. Now, I'm going to give you another term. It's not the same as pantheism. You guys know that one? That God is... This microphone, and he is this chair, and he is the trees outside. No, he is very much distinct from what he created, and yet at the same time, he is present among and in and through all that he created. Every natural process, he is working it. Every natural material law of the physical universe, he is sustaining and upholding it. The reason we live in a rational universe where you know that the laws of physics are the same at the far reaching edges of the universe as they are here is because they came from the mind of a rational being who created them and sustains them by his power. We serve a God who is creator. And a God who is sustainer. And although we like to think of ourselves as theists, quite often our thinking pattern can fall into deism. That he's not present. That he's not here. That he's not at work in my circumstances. Friend, all of creation is trying to tell you this morning that he is here. That he is present. And that he isn't working your circumstances. One of the things that I will tell you you should be doing to turn your what ifs into God is, is get out in nature. Get outside. I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean literally. Get outside. Maybe not this weekend because it's been blistering hot, but you know what I mean. One of the quickest ways to relieve your stress is to get out in God's creation. One of the places that I have experienced His presence more than any other is on a mountaintop where I have a pan panoramic view of His creation. 
And I can turn 360 degrees in all directions and see what He has done. I'll never forget standing in Colorado, highest elevation I'd ever been at, almost 13,000 feet, standing, panorama, looking at all the Rocky Mountains that God created. And a tear came to my eye and I said to myself, God, You who created all this, you made all this and you sustain it all by your power. You would concern yourself with the affairs of my life. You would involve yourself intimately in my life. And you created all this and you sustained all this. Get outside. Look at what he's done. Feel his closeness in his kingdom and his creation. And then Jesus poses a question right here in the middle. And the question he poses is, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? <laughs> Isn't that great? You know the answer to that question is rhetorical. Of course not. But did you know that you could have quite the opposite effect? Did you know that worry can take hours away from your life? Oh yes. There's science behind this. In fact, Worry causes your brain to release stress hormones that you know is cortisol and adrenaline. It goes into your bloodstream. Now, what was cortisol and things like adrenaline designed to do for you as a human being? It was designed to give you a burst of energy in the moment that you needed it because our ancient ancestors were like fighting lions and stuff, right? So you were given that energy to fight that lion or run up that tree. And when you made it and when the trauma was over, there's release. The tension is released. But here's the thing. Your brain can't tell the difference. When you're tensed up and when you're stressed, it interprets it as you're being in trouble. So because you're in trouble, you need these hormones. And it's going to release those hormones. But here's the deal. Those hormones were never designed to stay in your bloodstream over long periods of time. They are toxic to your bloodstream if they stay there over long periods of time. And they will begin to have devastating physical effects on you. Headaches. Back pain. Digestive issues. Stomach ulcers. Lowering your immune system. Heart attacks and stroke are among just a few of the effects that doctors tell us that worry and anxiety have on our lives. Now, have I raised your worry level? Are you worrying about worrying too much now? Like, maybe I'm worrying too much. Um, don't do that. The next example that Jesus gives us has to do directly with our clothing. I love this. He is so practical. He's, he's talking, again, not metaphorically, but literally about your clothing. Now, it would have been quite shocking for a Jewish person to hear what Jesus said about this. Look at verse 28 with me again. He says, Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. Now the reason we need to understand why this is so shocking is because Solomon was considered the ideal. His kingdom was considered the ideal kingdom. It was when Israel controlled the most land, had the best diplomatic relations of any point in time in their history, and had the most wealth of any time in their history. So any Jewish person who's being directed back to Solomon, usually they were thinking back at how ideal and wonderful the circumstances were under King Solomon's reign. Things went bad after that. In fact, many of the prophets, when they are describing what Israel could be if they would but serve God, many of the scripture commentators will point out and say, here the prophet is referring back to the Solomonic Ideas. That just means that they're referring back to the glory of Israel's kingdom under this king. And, and did you notice what Jesus said? This would have been a shock. <laughs> Even Solomon, the king that you say had the most glory of any king ever, was not arrayed like 
a lily. Wow. Think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. How wonderful and how beautiful God's creation is. But he's saying more than just telling you not to worry about your clothing provisions. He is expressing something countercultural. What he is saying countercultural is that God's people don't look at this world's kingdom the way everybody else does. He's telling God's people that our hope is not in the might and the power of the kingdom. This was reverse thinking from what they understood. All they knew was power through might. He says God's power and God's kingdom isn't coming through those things. In fact, God's power and God's kingdom may look as fragile as a lily. It may start like a mustard seed. But God's kingdom is going to grow and it's going to flourish in ways you don't understand yet. And so what he's trying to come up, get across to them is a countercultural truth that we live as a group of humble exiles in the middle of a kingdom that is not our own. And we are citizens of a kingdom that is far greater, that's not here yet all the way, but is yet coming. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. So our clothing... What strange kingdom ideals Jesus is giving us. But if the truth he's giving us is so countercultural to what we know today, have you taken the time in this sermon yet to ask yourself the question, are my worries the same as the worries of this world? Are my concerns the same as their concerns? You know, I've got to talk to you parents for just a moment. And even you grandparents. You need to ask yourself questions about what you're teaching your kids to be concerned with. I don't think it gets any more practical than clothing, does it? Having children judge other children by their clothing? It's all too common. And now we've got the advent of this thing that you may have trouble connecting with if you're not on Instagram. But I recently got on Instagram, okay? Much to my wife's chagrin because I take candles of her all the time and I post them up there. So follow me and see all of her pictures. I'm going to get killed after service, but it was worth it. It was, it was worth it. But with social media has come the advent of something known as the selfie. You ever seen anybody out in public taking a selfie? Have you ever seen anything more ridiculous in all of your life? <laughs> Does my chin look good? Can, can you see that double chin now? If you hold it just right, it'll go away. And I'm seeing these young kids just out at restaurants just... <laughs> And, 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 and people, you know, they, they want to show off what they're wearing. And they want to make sure it looks good. You know, they'll put the gym clothes on. They'll take a selfie. Head to the gym. Now, I, I just picture in my mind, they go in and put on sweatpants and then eat tater chips after they do that. There's something in my head. I don't think they ever make it to the gym. I just think they take the picture. That's what I think. But, but you know what's happening today? You get how obsessed we're getting with image? You know the kind of feminist I am? I'm the kind of feminist that says my daughters can go on and do anything, but they don't have to capitulate to perverted male desires to get there. I believe in women's power. And I believe in young boys being taught at home how to be a man by their father and not have to go out and learn from these testosterone driven monsters. <laughs> Just kidding, they're not monsters. They're made in God's image, okay? I mean them. I mean them. These testosterone driven, out of control kids, and this is what being a man looks like. I believe in young men learning from their fathers what a man looks like. And, and, and I believe, let me, let, me, let me just give you something extremely practical. 
Jesus, again, being practical about our clothing. If you want to teach your kids not to be affirmed by their image, then you need to make sure that they're getting all the affirmation they need at home. And so they're not having to go out and find it somewhere else. Now that's positive. Teach them at home that their affirmation is within their family unit, not somewhere out there to have to be gained somehow. That's positive. Negativity will push them away. You don't want your kids getting in the mainstream of this world. Because the mainstream of this world isn't going to the right place. The mainstream of this world isn't going to eternal life. Jesus said that the way of destruction is very broad. It's easy to get there. But he described eternal life as a narrow gate. In a straight way. Friends, if you are teaching your children actively or passively that they should concern themselves and worry about what everyone else does, don't expect your children to stand out and make a difference for Christ in this world. Look at verses 31 through 32. So Jesus once again tells us not to worry because in verse 32 he says, it's the Gentiles who strive after these things. Please, I'm asking you, don't live up to your name as a Gentile. That was another common Jewish rhetorical device is when you were talking about a behavior that you didn't like and you didn't want somebody to partake in, then you would say, you're acting like a Gentile. So don't act like what your family heritage is as Gentiles. Act like God's people, okay? And for Jesus' audience, when he says it's the Gentiles who strive after these things, he would have been on a high mountain in Capernaum and he would have been able to see directly across Tiberias. And Tiberias was a city, a Gentile pagan city, known for its opulence, its theaters, its entertainment, its lavish lifestyle. And Jesus was able to say, don't be like them. Those are the things they're striving for. We're not striving for those things. Well, I don't know, because I can tell you right now, it looks to me a lot like the church is striving for exactly what this world is striving for. It shouldn't be, friends. I'm not striving for those things. Oh, I can. Catch me on the right day. And you'll see all kinds of inconsistencies, but God's working those out on me. Is He working about you too? We're striving for what Jesus told us to strive for. He said, verse 33, strive first for the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You see, when Jesus said that we're to strive first for His kingdom, you need to understand what that means. The kingdom, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, is Jesus' shorthand way of saying that Israel's kingdom as the hope for the world has come to completion in Jesus. When He talks about kingdom, He's talking about how light that's Jesus has pierced into the darkness. That's the world. And Jesus has brought the kingdom into the darkness of this world. When Jesus talks about the kingdom, He's not talking about far off future, even though it will have a future fulfillment. He's talking about right now, you're living out kingdom values. You're bringing hope to the dark places. You're bringing light where there is none. Striving for His kingdom means getting involved in God's mission. I don't think you got that. Listen, striving for God's kingdom is getting involved in God's mission. Can you say amen? Amen. You see, when you're on a mission with God, you are involved in something so much greater than yourself, and it brings so much significance to who you are that you don't have time for work. So it's no wonder why Jesus follows us up in verse 34 and says, So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be worthy of its own, wor worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. So keep this in mind, friends. The business of the kingdom will keep you occupied all you need to be today without worrying about tomorrow. It's hard to be involved in God's mission and be striving for His kingdom 
If all you're thinking about is tomorrow, God's kingdom needs you today. If I'm worrying about what's coming then, I'm not present in the moment to minister to what's in front of me. And God has called me to minister to what's in front of me right now in the present. Be present in the moment. Be fully present for today because that's what God is calling you to. How many of you are valuing God's kingdom and His righteousness over the things of this world? I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to ask the lady to come up. Listen, listen to me carefully. This is, this is an important point. God has led us to this moment where I want you to prepare your hearts. If this message is spoken to you this morning, to prepare your hearts to come up here around this altar and kneel. And this is what I believe God's direct word is today. Again, this is a quote from the old pastor David Wilkerson who says, God is calling you to give Him all your tomorrows. That, that's what He wants. He wants no less than all your tomorrows. You see, the reason that you're stuck, the reason that you're in a constant state of worry and anxiety is because you've not given them your tomorrows yet. Sure, we, we love to give them our past. It's done. It's over with. And we want forgiveness. So we'll bring our past to Him. And we'll say, erase the past. Forgive me. Throw my sins as far as the east is from the west. And He does it. And we give it to Him. But we are reluctant to give Him our tomorrows. I want you to know, dear friends, that every time you worry and every time you experience anxiety, you're saying to God, you're telling God that I want to hang on to my tomorrows. I don't want to surrender them to you. I want to hang on to them. I'm not ready to give them over to you yet. I don't feel comfortable giving over my tomorrows to you. But can I tell you something, friends? The Lord would say to you today, was I not trustworthy in the past? The Lord would say to you today, have I not been trustworthy to you today? Did you wake up this morning and did you find my mercies new and waiting on you when you got out of bed? then you should know if I was trustworthy yesterday and if you found me faithful today, you should know what my nature is. It is that I will be the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that gentle shepherd that has led you up till now wants you to give him your tomorrows. Bow your heads with me and give your neighbor some privacy as you close your eyes. I don't have time to preach another sermon on Psalm 23, although I'd love to. But you think about your gentle master who has led you. You think of the beauty of that song. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, who makes me lie down in green pastures. Leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That's a beautiful destination, isn't it? And then it says that He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. <laughs> Wait a minute. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Paul's right there a moment in your hearts and in your minds. You see, you love the idea of getting to the green pastures and lying down beside the still waters, don't you? You believe that's your destination, but that seems like some far off thing in eternity. What you're having a hard time with is you're having a hard time with trusting Him for just the next day and then the next day because what you're seeing in front of you is valley and darkness and shadows. 
But here's what your general shepherd is saying to you today. To get to the green pastures. To get to the cool still waters. You've got to trust me. You've got to let go of your worry. You've got to give me your tomorrow. If you'll give me your tomorrow, you've got a future brighter than what you can see right now. But he will not force his will. And he's asking, he's calling you by name this morning. Listen to him. He said, give those tomorrows to me. So I'm going to invite you right now. I'm going to ask you just to be bold and step out. If God has called your name this morning, just come up here and kneel at the front. This is a symbol, but it's a powerful symbol of coming and kneeling here and saying, God, I'm surrendering my tomorrows to you. Come on, don't be shy. Be bold and step out. Thank you. Come on. Come up around this altar. I surrender my tomorrows. I give my tomorrows to you. You're in here today and you're worried about your children. You've not given your children's tomorrows over to God yet. You're in here today and you're in the older stage of life. You are in a moment where you're asking yourself, what does tomorrow look like for me? I'm afraid. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what's ahead of me. I want you to come up here to this altar. And I want you to give God your tomorrows. Come on. Somebody needs to step out that's not stepping out yet. Get up here and give God your tomorrows. Let Him lead you through this. Maybe you've never made a move like this before. You need to make this move today. Thank you. Come on, guys. Thank you. Come on. God wants your tomorrows. He wants your tomorrows. He's got better plans for them than you do. I hope you know that God has better plans for your life than you do. Now friends, if you're led, if you feel led to come up, led of the Holy Spirit, just to lay your hand on the shoulder, just to encourage one of these up here, would you come would you come and encourage one of these and just lay your hand on their shoulder this morning? Let them know that you're here to support them. 